Good deal. Happy Friday, everybody. I am Bree with Apollo here with my fabulous co-host, Melissa McDaniel. We're chatting with Jan Dunn today uh, about what is dance medicine and science and how is it impacting performance athletes, obviously specifically dancers, but how is it impacting performance athletes beyond that? Um, this is the topic. Is, uh, we hear dance medicine and science a lot right now. When we, when we talk in the dance community, you hear those words. Sometimes I think we hear those words and we're just desensitized to what it actually is that we're talking about. So we've invited Jan to give us some clarity and shed some wonderful insight and wisdom. She has so much experience um, in the dance medicine and science field and has done a lot of the work that has brought us forward to this place today. So we're excited to dig in. Before we do, this is season three of Beyond the Steps. This is a podcast we are doing every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern live where we bring in a guest expert to address a topic um, and a variety of issues. We pick one question and we dive really deep with a guest expert to answer questions on topics like racism, gender inequities, dance medicine and science, psychology, nutrition, and more. Um, this, this is really meant to educate. It's meant to lay a foundation. I think a lot of what's going on in the dance community and other performing and moving arts is that there's there's not a lot of regulation there's not a lot of updated yeah. information and we kind of get thrown into the cyclical uh pattern of repeating the ways we were taught and when you know better you do better that's why we created this series this season we're going live on facebook youtube and instagram we've added youtube to the mix we're also turning um beyond the steps into a podcast and into a blog. So we're, we're going to be introducing that at the beginning of 2023. Stay tuned. In the meantime, Melissa, happy Friday. Welcome back. Yes, happy Friday, everyone. Got a uh, comment that we're getting a little bit of feedback on Instagram. So we will try to get that fixed as soon as we possibly can. Thank you so much for that. Uh, but I do want to go ahead and introduce our amazing guest who I want to start by saying that uh, Jan, who is our guest today, Jan Dunn, is going to be with us once a month, once this month, November and December, as a part of a series on dance, medicine, and science. We're going to do these series three times during our season uh, with different guests, and we are so honored to have Jan be our first guest as part of the series. Um, so Thank I'm gonna, you. I'm introduce her so everybody knows who they are tuning in to listen to three times uh, over the next few months. Jan is a dance educator and dance medicine specialist in Denver, Colorado with a BS and master's. You are not in Denver anymore? Savannah, Georgia, as of two weeks. Oh, she's in yes. Savannah. In Southern? Oh, she she's a just moved now. to Savannah. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yes. <laughs> That's okay. She was in Colorado for a long time. She was in Colorado, and now she has moved due south with us down here uh, in the southeast. I'm in North Carolina. So uh, in Savannah, uh, Georgia, she's the co founder and co chair of the Bridge Dance Project, co director of, oh, are you still with Denver Dance Medicine Associates? I am. Yes. Yes, uh, co-director, um, um, co-director of Denver Dance Medicine Associates and dance wellness editor for, uh, for dancers.org. Previously, she was dance faculty and dance wellness coordinator at several universities, including University of Colorado, Colorado Boulder, and Loyola Marymount University, and is currently working with Metro State University in Denver to develop a wellness program. She was involved in the founding of IADAMS, serving as president, executive director, and on the board of directors from 1990 to 2012. Wow, what an impact. 1990 to 2012. Mm -hmm. You are IADAMS. Um, yeah. she, was the, she was the chair of NDA Committee on Dance, Medicine, and Science, co-chair um, International Dance Medicine Conference in Taiwan in 2004, and co-founder of the Journal of Dance, Medicine, and Science. Jan, we are so honored to have you here. Thank you so much Thank for you. being with us. And she's also the co-chair of the Bridge Dance Project, which is doing fantastic things in the world of dance. We cannot forget to mention the Bridge Dance Project. Uh, Jan, welcome back. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for having me, guys. And I'm excited to do three different sessions over the next few months and talk about whatever it is you want to talk about. Um, yeah, I have a long career, and and uh, I guess this comes with getting older. <laughs> <laughs> a career, yeah. Maybe. It means that there's no. a lot of stuff up here in my head, you know, as well as written material to share. And uh, that's what my whole life has all been about is education in the dance field. So fire away. Yeah, I think it's important to recognize we chose dance medicine and science as our first quarterly series. That's kind of where 
uh, you know, that's where we started at Apollo. That's where our heart is. That's where Melissa's lane is with TP Dance Creations. Um, and it's just such an important um, there is an important body of work that's being done to advance an industry that stays a little bit stuck. So I think it's a really a great way to kick off our quarterly series. We're excited to have you. Everybody, thanks for joining. We have friends on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. Please share this conversation um, and comment, add your questions for Jan so we can get those answered for you throughout this next 45 minutes or so. Jan, let's get into it. Dance, medicine, and science is such a broad title that encompasses many different things, right? So to simplify, explain for everybody out there and us here, what does dance medicine and science refer to exactly? And how is it different than sports medicine research done in other athletics? Okay, so so dance medicine and science, let's separate it into dance medicine and science. Um, so dance medicine is literally the care of injured dancers. Um, you know, doctors, physiotherapists, athletic trainers, the people who work with dance injuries and uh, what they do and how they better their care and how to integrate that into a dance community. So that's what actual dance medicine is. Dance science is the research behind all of that. So it's very much more about, you know, if there's a new method for doing a knee surgery, for example, what's the research behind that that led to that new, that new type of knee surgery? So they're kind of two distinct fields. Dance, uh, dance science tends to be more in academia and university dance departments where there are people all over the world doing this kind of research and in medical institutions as well. And then obviously the dance medicine portion is in the clinic. Uh, or backstage with the dancers where a lot of times there's uh, physio. Whoops, sorry. No, it's okay. Phone just went down. Phone's flying. Phone down. Yeah. Phone flying. Are. You got a good view of my ceiling, I'm sure. For that's okay. Um, so, so that's kind of the, the basic difference between those two terms, but they have been joined together, lumped together for a very long time, going back to the very beginnings of the field which was, oh gosh, going back all the way to the late 1970s and then in the 80s. And it very much, dance medicine and science is very much an outgrowth of sports medicine and science. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's not connected to it in terms of um, research or other, other types of, of, of things, but it was an outgrowth of it. And by that, I mean that um, dance educators and medical people who were working uh, well, the medical people were working with sports people, obviously, for a long time because sports medicine started way before that. But there were people in the dance education field who said, why can't we do this for dancers? Why can't we have this same kind of research and help and health care for dancers that has been going on in the last several decades for sports? Mm -hmm. So that's where the impetus came in the late in the 1970s and then going into the 80s. Uh, in terms of how all of this evolved. And there's many different, it, uh, it kind of started in little pockets, mostly in the US, but not, not completely in the US, in England, um, in other countries in Europe. Um, and then gradually more and more people started practicing and talking and connecting. And then various organizations such as IADAMS, International Association for Dance Medicine and Science, was formed. So it, it was a, a burgeoning, but it was very much from the grassroots on up. So I hope it, that helps. It, it, it does help. And I think it, what I want to understand now is why didn't we hear about this so much? You hear it now quite a bit. We didn't hear about the work being done for a long time. And it seemed to only affect people at the professional level or the collegiate yeah. level why is it so relevant to dancers, the dance community as a whole, and what is it providing now that was the missing link for so many years? Well, it's relevant to dancers at any level, whether they're recreational dancers, university dancers, civic company dancers, uh, small studio dancers, competition dancers. It's relevant because healthier dancers last longer. That's the bottom line. When dancers are healthy in every respect, and we're talking a whole rounded package, not just physical health, but nutritional health and mental health. When, when all of these things come together to create a healthier 
young, sorry, phone wants to go away again, uh, a healthy, healthier young dancer, that healthier young dancer is going to have many more years of longevity and enjoying their field, whether again, they're recreational or professional or student or teacher or what. Mm -hmm. So um, it's taken a lot of years, I think, because um, dance is a, especially ballet is a centuries old tradition mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. people don't like change in general. That's just a characteristic of the human of human beings. We don't like change in general. So as do you, you think said, dancers, do you think dancers more so though? Because I feel like you look at other athletics and they have this, they have more available to them, I would say. So why, why was it so slow to start in dance? I think it was so slow to start, be, to, to start in dance. And, and, you know, I would need dance psychologists to maybe, yeah, to of course, in, yeah. to weigh in on this, but but dance is a high, I'm, I never say this word right, hierarchical, uh, I think that's the right pronunciation, yeah. um, society. You know, dancers yeah. uh, learn from their teachers, uh, and in general, there's no right. talk back. Uh, whatever the teacher <laughs> says is the word of, you know, is, is the word in capital it's letters. The word, yeah. And so dancers are taught not to question, just to do whatever teacher says, and yeah. that that particular tradition goes back centuries. And um, one of the things that is happening in the dance medicine world or, or dance science world in this whole field in general is more empowerment to dancers. Um, <clears throat> there is um, a new book that is not actually out yet, but it was edited and put together by Dr. Jeff Russell, who is on the BDP board of directors yeah. and is a major uh, force in the dance. Medicine. We love Dr. Russell. We love ourselves some Dr. Russell. Everybody loves Dr. <laughs> Russell. He's amazing. But uh, one of the things that that particular book, uh, he put together the book with a lot of different authors, myself just being one of many, uh, to talk about different aspects. And it's actually going to be used as a, um, I believe, a college textbook. Oh, um, wow. That's wonderful. But, um, it, um, it talks a lot about empowerment and giving, um, giving the authority to dancers to speak up for themselves and how, how this whole um, framework of the, te the teacher's word as, as, you know, excuse me, the word of God, you know, mm -hmm. they, they don't question it at all. Yeah. Um, how, how that tradition, which has been going on for centuries in the dance world, how that needs to be looked at and, and dancers today need to really empower themselves to take more action to better their physical mental health condition. Um, but I think there's many reasons why it's taken so long. I don't, I am not a sports medicine person. I don't know that much about the sports medicine and science field. So I don't know if that same mentality mm -hmm. of teacher's word is all all right. encompassing. You never question teacher's word. I don't really know if that happens in the sports field at all. I don't know if mm. one of you have that knowledge or can say anything. I, I don't know. I think it, it happens, but I think there's organizations in place to check those coaches. And I yeah, think that's right. the difference between dance yeah. and everything else is that there are checks and balances in place for coaches and authority figures and other and other athletics and other movements mm -hmm. that just aren't yeah. because dance has no governing body and there's no standardization. There's nobody doing the checking, right? It, exactly. it virtually goes unchecked. And right. um, I, you know, Nicole D, uh, thank you for your comment on Instagram. We have been trained to dance through the pain. Absolutely, we have. Yeah. Um, it's almost like a badge of honor, you know, if you can do it, right? Exactly. exactly. But but I wonder now, just based on what you just said, you know it is hierarchical and it is, it is, we, we listen and it is the word, it's the gospel when, when dance teachers speak, but does that mean that we don't believe that anymore? Or do, does it just mean that people are getting more educated and think, are prioritizing think, their health and wellness for the first time? Yeah. I, th I think it's slowly changing that people are getting more, um, more able to people, meaning young dancers, um, are getting more able to, um, 
to speak up for themselves and to take care of their own health care better than they were a number of years ago. And in addition to that, um, Dan's teachers are slowly, and I want to emphasize the word slowly in capital letters, yeah. um, be, becoming more well-educated about all of these different factors that can impact young dancers. Um, it's still it's still a uh, uphill battle. Let's put it that way. So, for example, in the what I call kind of the traditional dance medicine and science world, which encompasses IADMS, the dance medicine organization, uh, and the professional dance companies that have um, teams of medical people, the ballet companies, the large ones that have a lot of services that aren't available to the local studio dancer. Um, all of those people um, have, have access to this kind of information. And they, that has changed a lot in the last 30 years, as well as university dance. Um, one small quick story at the university dance level, uh, an organization of um, university dance chairs that I was once part of a number of years ago. This is going back to the 19, early 1990s. And at one of those, this is when dance medicine was first starting to uh, form really. And I Adams, the dance medicine organization was first formed and I was involved in that. And I went to this conference of university dance chairs and I started talking about how this information should be part of a dancer's education, mm -hmm. uh, in this case at the university level. And I literally had people in that meeting go, what do we need that for? We don't need that. You know, we're fine. We've been fine for 300 years, whatever. Um, and, you know, I was not in a position to offer much right. in the way of a rebuttal. But so here we are 30 years later. And at least in the U.S., I can't say all by any means, but a huge majority of university dance departments have courses in anatomy in um I'm going to say injury prevention, and I want to say quickly, that's not a term that that's we're using term. anymore. No, right. uh, now we're saying injury risk reduction because you cannot prevent no. injuries at all. So people are slowly starting to transition out of that. But the point is, is that those courses didn't exist 30 years ago. And now, and, and as I said, I was kind of laughed out of the room when I suggested that dancers needed to have this kind of information. And now it's just taken for granted that these courses yeah. are taught at university level. Mm -hmm. And and with, with the Bridge Dance Project, um, which is specifically geared to competition dancers, to young competition dancers. And I'm going back to our first board meeting uh, that we uh -huh. had three years ago. And uh, Casey Cope Jones, your partner and mine, um, who is one of the founders of the Bridge along, along with me, um, she sat there at our board meeting and she told everybody there, I mean, all, all the board members, it's going to be an uphill battle. It's going to be a long time before this information is listened to and really integrated. And we all knew that. Yeah. Um, and so, so I think it just takes, if we're all still here in 30 years, you guys will be, I won't, but you all will be, you know, I'm guessing you'll see the same kind of progress um, that I saw in, in quote, the more or less regular dance field, yeah. ballet, modern. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I hope so. I really yeah. do. I hope, I hope so too. It, it really is. It really is slow. For those of you who are just joining us, this is Beyond the Steps. We're here every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. And today we're chatting with Jan Dunn about um, dance, medicine, and science. What is it? And how is it impacting um, dancers uh, specifically? Um, but also can you know can have some impact on other performance athletes uh, who are out there. Where we just talked about the difference between dance medicine and science, and why it's moving so slowly, and our just frustration about why, why, why is it going so slowly? Hoping, hoping that it moves forward. Yes, Jane, I see your. I see no, your I was going to say no. Yeah, yeah, we're talking about how it's moving slowly, but at the same time. Look at this, what you guys are doing, okay? Look at all the different sites that are out there now. Yeah, um, a lot. Valuable sites. And then we, we do want to address the, the, the question of 
what about if you're not sure how valuable a site is? And, and mm. we can offer some suggestions yeah. on that. But but none of this existed 10 years ago. Yeah. Right. All sure. the stuff that we're talking about. So that's a huge positive and, and social media as we know it now didn't exist 10 years ago. Right. So all yeah. of this information that you all and other people are able to get out there on the web, on social media, it's phenomenal because that just helps to increase the speed with which this information will gradually be introduced. Right. That's right. That's um, right. I want to uh, make sure that you are sharing this episode to Jan's point. There's, we are creating these resources now. It's happening now. And the more that we share it, the more the information will be more quickly disseminated and we will experience change a lot faster. So make sure you are sharing now that we have social media in that capacity. That's right. Uh, I want to talk about a, 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 there's a comment here from Nicole D. Those who, on Instagram, those who do not have doctors on their staff trying to find a doctor who understands dance and how it helps them is very difficult. Um, and I'm hopeful to hear that it might be changing. That is so, so very true. I mean, I remember having injuries back, you know, back in the olden days uh, when I was dancing and you couldn't find a doctor that specialized in dance uh, here in, in, in the Charlotte area. So we really are people like Jan and Dr. Russell and everybody who's contributing to this field is going to help, um, help us um, get there and form that network of professionals that we can trust. Um, do you want me to say? Do you want me to say anything quickly about what you just said? Because sure. somebody somebody just said, "How do we find people?" Am I, is that uh, correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, there there are actually resources now to, uh, for for dancers in, you know, Timbuktu, Idaho. Mm -hmm. I don't know to find uh, to find help if necessary. Um, uh, I Adams, the Dance Medicine Organization, now has a directory of okay. of healthcare providers worldwide, mm -hmm. doctors for dancers. Um, online is a, a phenomenal site to try to find help wherever you are. Um, and even just people like me, individual people working in the field who know people all over the country, you know, my email's out there. People can email me anytime they want and say, you know, I live in Timbuktu, Idaho, and I need an answer. <laughs> who can you recommend? So there are, there are ways to find good people now, which in that that didn't exist five years ago either. Right. So those directories are out there. We're going to drop those in the chats here so that you can access those and probably talk about them a little bit later uh, near the end of the show. I want to I wanna talk about some of the struggles because we kind of segued into that. One struggle is finding <laughs> professionals who have a specialization in dance that can really help us um, as dancers. Uh, I would imagine, and I'm coming, we're, we, I, you can definitely... Um, uh, come with any that you have. But I think another one is kind of changing that mindset of another struggle of dancers, changing that mindset of dancing through the pain. Like you have to, you have to push through. I feel like that's a big challenge for us as dancers. Yeah. Do you think that mind shift, mind shift is happening uh, for us? And how do we, how do we, I feel like it's a very toxic trait of ours as dancers. How do we get yeah. it? Yeah. It, it's, it again, I think it's just the education coming up from the bottom, which is what all of us are about. We're mm -hmm. trying to influence teachers, dancers, parents. Parents are a huge part of this, especially mm -hmm. with young dancers, um, about the fact that no, your kids shouldn't be dancing with pain. And we just do it through all of these modalities that we're all talking about, that, that you're doing it through social media postings, uh, seminars, you know, the Bridge Dance Project, part of what the Bridge Dance Pro Project is all about is um, local chapters. We have about 30 in different places all over the U.S. and a few outside the U.S. And the people who are involved in those chapters come from both the medical field, um, who, who actually might be physical therapists or doctors who work with dancers, and the competition dance field, teachers mm -hmm. in particular. And um, those chapters put on uh, seminars that are open, that are free. Everything we do is free um, and are open to teachers, dancers, parents uh, to come and learn more about whatever it is they're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, the Atlanta chapter has put on several great seminars. The Los Angeles chapter has. The Houston chapter has. Mm -hmm. um, so 
those are kind of the sorts of formats for getting this information out there. Um, and again, I know, I know it's going to be a long haul. And it's going to take a long time, but, but uh, there are ways for people to be aware of it. Can I talk about parents for a second? Uh, in, in this, I, you talked about the, the kind of the bottom up philosophy and you would think because they are the, the people with the dollars that that would work. However, we have had great challenge, I feel like, in doing this work and me being directly involved with parents on a day-to-day basis, still being in the studio space, of getting them to, quote unquote, vote with their dollars. They will not withdraw their support from organizations that are doing harm to young competitive dancers or studios who are supporting those organizations who are doing harm to young dancers. How is it because, world, Melissa, is it because they are they don't know what's going on because there's a lot of speculation, but not a lot of actual fact and quote unquote evidence? Or is it because they don't want to believe it because it's, it's the pop, they want to, they want to keep up with the Joneses for lack of a better term? I, I think what you just said it is, yeah. is, um, is unfortunately true. Um, um, you know, my, my daughter never wanted to dance. So I never dealt with her going into any field like that. And part of me was kind of grateful because I knew all the problems that, that, that could word. be. Yeah. Word. I'm, I'm yeah. like, everybody's like, is he, are you happy or do you, or you want your daughter to dance? Are you happy she's not dancing? I'm like, I don't know. If yes. I, want, I don't know yet. I'm, I'm okay with her not dancing right now. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I, I was, I was okay. She grew up around dance. She saw yeah. dance ballet, you know, from the time she was two years old, she, she, but, but she never expressed, and it, it had nothing to do with me influencing or one way or the right. other. She never expressed a desire to dance. And I was, I was kind of grateful along the way for that. Yeah. Um, but, but I think what you said, Brie, about um, keeping up with the Joneses, um, and especially, you know, you, you are, I don't know, I don't know what kind of teaching environment you work in, Melissa. What kind of teaching environment do you work in? I'm in a competitive studio, so I'm the competition okay. director. So, so both of you are, in, are, are very familiar with competitive dance. Yes. So mm-hmm. that's, that's what I was asking. So um, again, I, I'm, I'm speaking sort of off the top of my hat because as you both know, that is not my background in my background in dance is concert dance and academic yeah. dance. And everything I have learned about competition dance has been through the graces of people like Brie and Casey and everybody I've been in contact with through the bridge the last three years. But yeah. I think part of it is, you know, well, Mary Jones's daughter just won yeah. an award for blah, blah, blah. And I want my daughter to win that award. Mm-hmm. And, and so I mean, you all have to tell me if that's a correct attitude, but I think oh, that yes. keeping up with the Joneses thing that you just said is part of it. Um, and and not really realizing, parents not really realizing what can happen physically to your kid. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we talk about, um, you know, what, what Apollo has had on the website with Mia Michaels talking about the 16-year-old with a double hip replacement. It's very and real, yeah. Yeah, and so many people don't even understand that. And I had one one doctor, a dance med- long time dance medicine doctor, who uh, was very well known in the field, but not familiar with competition dance. Mm-hmm. And when I commented, when I made that comment to him, he went, "Oh no, you must mean sixty year old." And I went, "No, no, no I meant sixteen. Yeah. Um, and he was like, "Unbelievable." Um, <clears throat> so. It's a combination of so many different factors. Um, it is. And it's it's also a, in order for the parents to have this information, you really have to bring them into the fold. They are a huge part of the solution um, in voting with their dollars. You have to bring them into the fold and you have to share things with them. But I also think there's a really fine line in dance where um, uh, educators try to keep parents out in of the their equation as much as possible because they don't want to deal with the complaining they don't want to have the questions they don't want to they don't want to deal with everything that comes with that and so mm-hmm. i feel like it's this really odd 
dichotomy of like the parents need to be part of the process and they need to help make the decisions. But in order to do that, they need the information and to, need, to give them the information means you have to bring them in and you have to share with the parents and you have to make them part of your team. And those things are not those things do not work together sometimes. <laughs> so yes. I think that's also something we have to examine. And we've been saying on, that on the show for a couple years now is, is, you know, yes, you can have your boundaries with the parents and what, you know, what they are, are and are not allowed to do. But at the end of the day, it really benefits everybody if you can figure out how to make them part of the process. Right. Yeah. And I don't know, uh, how to you you all might have a better grip on how to get parents more involved i you know i just i honestly don't know i, I think I parents have, get very involved it's a matter no, of do I mean, you I, want I mean, them not, to be right well yeah but involved in the positive ways that we're talking yeah, about yeah yeah uh, as far as their daughter's dancer's house i mean i knew one small example of how we can all give a million examples. I'm sorry, but but I remember this one of of a of a, a mother. She was an orthopedic surgeon, and her dancing daughter had an ankle injury that she ignored and just told her to keep dancing on it. Um, and she was an orthopedic surgeon, and the kid ended up having serious issues. And the physical therapist who finally saw her said, "You can't keep dancing. You got to stop and let this thing rest." So. Yeah, it's it's a big issue. It's hard. It's hard. Um, we're going to keep the conversation going. We're chatting with Jan Dunn today, who's the uh, co-founder and co-chair of the Bridge Dance Project. And among many other things, she's a long line of, uh, of experience in the dance medicine and science field and has kind of evolved our community as far as it has. She's been instrumental in that. So we're excited to have Jan with us today. This is season three of Beyond the Steps. I'm Bree Zabrowski here with my fabulous co-host and friend, Melissa McDaniel. And we're talking today to Jan about what is dance medicine and science and how is it impacting dance athletes and performance athletes today. Jan, today more than ever, we are inundated with information. Uh, and we've talked about the impact of social media and how instrumental, it's kind of that double-edged sword, right? And it can be confusing and it can be hard for parents and dancers and teachers and frankly frustrating because we don't have a lot of time, right? Um, to know which organizations to listen to, if the info you're getting is credible, um, which ones are legit and which ones are not. It can also be a huge turnoff to listen to. And you and I have talked about this at length over the years. It can be really, it's frustrating for me. I don't have the science medical background. I understand anatomy very well, obviously, and I, I can follow along, but the science medical jargon, I don't have patience for it. I'm like, right. shoot it to me straight, give it to me direct, what are you talking about? Tell me what I need to do, right? But you, a lot of time, dance, medicine, and science, we get so technical that it can be a turnoff and people just stop listening, yeah. which is, I think, part of the problem in terms of infiltrating commercial and competitive dance, right? We mm -hmm. talked about that. Mm -hmm. So so what are your recommendations for parents and educators who want to stay up to date on the research being done in dance, medicine, and science and want to share that information provided by the professionals um, but maybe don't have all that much time and patience to listen, to sort through and filter through all the jargon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think, I think listening, number one, I'm going to do a pitch for the bridge dance project again. Sorry. Yeah. Um, one Go of the things that, that we were founded on, one of our principles is talking to dancers, teachers, and parents in everyday language and everyday dance language. So in other words, if you're going to talk about, um, external rotation of the hip well a lot of dancers don't have a clue what that means that's turnout guys that's all that is right. it means turnout. so using using dance language everyday language and not necessarily scientific language we can educate as we talk um if you go to the website for dancers.org which uh is an, a website that uh has been run out of a wonderful teacher in chicago since 2010 something like that and um one of she she found out about dance medicine and science information years ago and asked me to write one article just explaining what it was literally mm -hmm. 
And I did. And the response from her readership, which is nationwide, was so positive, like, oh, wow, I want to learn more about this. And these, it's primarily a ballet site, but we started an actual portion of her website, which is solely for dance medicine and science. So over the many years that we've, that we've had that, um, we've written so many articles, uh, my, myself and many other people. I've had many people do articles for that website. And the number one criteria is you have to write in everyday language. Okay. You cannot write sure in do. scientific language. So if you, and yes, we're about education. So if you're going to use the term external rotation of the hip, fine. But then you got to put next to it, that means huh. turn it. Right. Uh, so that everybody knows what you're talking about, but you're educating them anatomically at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that, that is kind of concerning, Brie, from what you said about how do I know what information to, is good and what, what can I look at? And there's a lot of resources out there now, and there's a lot of groups. Um, the thing about dance is wonderful and frustrating at the same time is there's a lot of groups that are trying to accomplish the same thing, and they're working independently of each other right and so how do you know which ones are well okay so i'm going to give you a few a few guidelines and this actually is also on the website for fordancers.org and it's actually on our uh, bdp website now too um and it's kind of along the lines of what you're talking about because there's so much misinformation on the yeah. web um so a number of years ago this goes back to 2015-16 when Robin Kish, who is now a uh, co-chair of the bridge along with myself and Casey, Robin is a longtime dance medicine and science person, researcher, university faculty at Chapman University in California, Southern California. Uh, she was on the advisory board for um, uh, fordancers.org, the medical advisory board we had with these articles. And she said, I'm really getting concerned because that's when social media and the net was really starting to explode with this information. And she said, I'm really concerned because we see so much information out there that is just not good and even harmful. So the board or the, the advisory board for fordancers.org put together a list of criteria that one should look at if you're going to look at information online uh, and see if this is information you want you, you want yourself to have, you want your dancers to have, you want your teachers to have, or your parents to have. Can I go through it very quickly? Please do. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's it, in this, you can find this on BDP website and fordancers.org. But some of these, the kinds of questions that you you should ask. She said we are sharing four key points with you to help you evaluate websites and online information. Is the author a dancer, a former dancer, or at the very least, have they spent years learning about the art if they're not a dancer themselves? That's crucial. You don't want somebody who doesn't know anything about dance talking about dance. Um, number two, do they provide a clear bio of their qualifications and degrees, um, such as MD, PhD, MS, or in a related field, their experience and qualification in, in the field? I have seen sites online that say they are dance medicine websites that are written by Susie Jones with no, no qualifications or degrees or background or anything after her name telling you who she is and what gives her the right to say these kinds of things. Um, number three, do they provide clear references and sources for their information, indicating that they are current with the latest dance medicine and science research, and they're not claiming to be the sole expert on whatever it is they're talking mm. about? Oh, Again, I've one. seen a lot of a lot of sites where where Susie Jones is talking about how she knows what it is you should be doing, but not giving any kind of background information or, or criteria. Um, and then the the last point that w that our board came up with: if a program or something else is being sold on the site, if they're asking for your money, is it supported with external resources and credentials? So those kinds of guidelines, and those guidelines can all be found, as I said, on fordancers.org, as well as on the Bridge Dance Project site. But those are just some basic guidelines of when you're out there as a parent or a teacher or an older dancer looking to try to find information to kind of filter through what's out there and see what's the best, what's the best thing 
that you should be looking at, not just anybody's information. Yeah. And it just circle back to what you said, Jan, like I, I, I love that you said like dance medicine and science professionals. I know the work being done and the passion that is behind behind all of that. I've met so many of you and mm -hmm. the passion you all have for this industry is amazing and we're so lucky for it. Um, but I would encourage any dance medicine and science professionals out there to like know your audience, know who you're talking to, especially mm -hmm. because I think there's so much work being done to breach that commercial competitive space right now. And those are the kids mm -hmm. and the families that really, really need this information and this work. Edit yourself, audit yourself, and figure out how to deliver mm -hmm. that information short, sweet, to the point, and talk mm -hmm. about it in layman's terms so that it does reach the end target and it does have an impact because yeah. that's the way we're going to do it. It's not going to be the same way you talk to college dance programs or uh, professional dancers. It's going to it's going to sound different. It's going to look different. And that's really, really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I love the, my favorite one is they should not be claiming to be the sole source yeah. of this information. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that that, I think that in this social media age and where we are now, people say, I am the expert. I am the one, I am the person that you need to talk to. It's the me, 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 me generation. And that can be very dangerous. That's I think, right. that, you know, people who are skilled and knowledgeable are, are very quick to say, you can check behind me with a second opinion or another yeah. person, or you yeah. can check my, check my facts. Uh, yeah. So you got to be very, very, very careful. Um, you have careful. to be very discriminating in what you're looking at online. Yeah. Very yeah. And thank Absolutely. you for providing those. I think that's really helpful. Um, that's a, a really quick checklist and an easy checklist to remember. Um, Jan, yeah. I know we're reaching sort of the end of our time here. So before we leave, I think it's really important to talk about you know, we have a lot of uh, listeners and people watching from all areas of the dance community. And even beyond that, talk a little bit about why dance medicine and science education is so important at each of these levels. Quickly, I'm going to say one and then you give me give me a quick reason why they need to be paying attention. Studio and recreational dance programs. Again, I think it goes back to what we said at the very beginning, Brie. Um, healthier dancers dance longer. It doesn't matter what level you're dancing at, whether you're professional, recreational, whether you're a teacher, um, anybody who, who dances and loves dancing wants to do it as long as possible. And dance medicine and science is there to help you dance longer, healthier. That's the bottom line, I think, that answers that question. Thank you. Competitive dance. Um... Same thing. Competitive. That's, okay. Let, 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 let's get a little commercial let's expand. here. Yeah. 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 Um, healthier dancers win more. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Yeah. Because, because they can compete longer, stronger, healthier mm -hmm. without injuries, and they're going to win more. Yeah. And love that. That, gets in, that gets into financial issues that are positive for studio owners. Mm -hmm. What about school teams where you're, you're like, you know, they're doing this more for the social aspect. They love to dance, but it's not like, you know, it's not their whole world. You know, they have that social team atmosphere mm -hmm. and that vibe, that camaraderie. But they're, they're saying to you, well, this isn't going to be my whole life. Why does it matter? Why is it important for them? Well, again, because they like, what, even if they're going to do it for two or three or four years while they're in high school or college, um, they love it. They enjoy it for all the reasons that you just mentioned, social uh, interaction. Uh, they want to do it as long as they can uh, mm -hmm. in a healthy manner. Um, Terry Rao is uh, head of the National Dance Coaches Association, and she is on our BDP board. And she could speak at, at great lengths about what you just She has. Her. She's been on the show, too. Yeah. She's, she's fantastic. Sure. Yeah, yeah, she's great. And, and so it's the same thing. You just want to do what – dancers do what they do because they love it. Have you ever seen the, the, um, the Merce Cunningham phrase? Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to probably paraphrase it very badly. <laughs> but it has something to do with um, – Dancers are people who are drawn to the flame and are consumed by it. Mm -hmm. ah. We don't just hover on the outside of the flame. We go to the flame and we are consumed by it. And anybody who dances has that inner love of what they're doing. So at whatever you're doing, school team, competitive, mm -hmm. you know, social, recreational, 
you do it because you love it. And um, that's why we're all here. We just love what we do and we don't want to stop. Well, and to tack on too, like obviously that doesn't, we, we, nobody should ever have to sacrifice their body or pain or, you know, the rest, the quality of the rest of their life for something they enjoy doing, right? Like we can have both. We have now the tools and the resources, the education um, available to us to make better choices and do better in the classroom and for recovery, right? So we're not feeling like the Tin Man when we're in our 40s, right? So um, that, that's the bottom line there. But I, yeah, I, I think that your answer is the same for all of the above, which is do what you love longer. Now, and I love now, that. And let me just say one thing based on what you just said a second ago, sure. um, be, because it really speaks to me in, at this particular point in my life. Um, I'm in my 70s and um, I have a lot of not great body issues that come from dance because none of this information existed when I was growing up. When I mean, I came from a very traditional ballet studio where the teacher's word was law and all of that stuff that we talked about. So I, and I did have injuries when I was very young that have haunted me for many, many years and still do. Um, and so people who know me in my life now, I'm not, I might get teary, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, they have said, knowing everything that you know now, meaning about dance medicine and everything else, uh, with your current body that has some aches and pains, would you have done it ever any differently? No. Yeah. I never would have done it any differently, regardless of what happens now in this body. Yeah. Um, because that's who we are. We right. just love it. Right. Sorry, but sorry. do you think if, it, like, if there was a way to still do it that same way, but have better resources available. That would have been helpful though. Oh, yes. I mean, yeah. One of the reasons I went into this whole field uh, and I started getting involved in it in my uh, early thirties um, and forties um, was because the information wasn't there for me. Mm -hmm. to, and I already had a couple, one or two serious injuries at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't, I just felt this was so not necessary. And I luckily was in the right place at the right time with the best people who were in the four in the formative years of dance right. medicine and science. Um, so yeah, it would have helped me enormously if I had known it way back when. The blessing is yeah. that it's helping dancers now who are That's just right. like you and in the right. spot that you were in. Uh, those of you who are just joining us, we're about to wrap up, but please, please, please go back and watch this full episode with Jan Dunn. It has been absolutely amazing and insightful. You can find those recordings um, on Facebook um, at Apollo Performance, on Instagram at TP Dance Creations, on Apollo at TP Dance Creations, on YouTube at TP Dance Creations and Apollo Performance. There is no excuse whatsoever for you not to watch this episode. We have That's put it right. everywhere humanly possible. Um, you can also uh, sign up to uh, to get the episodes in your inbox using the link that we're about to what? put on Facebook and Instagram. What? That's amazing. There's no excuse for you not to watch this full episode. So please go do it. I think it's time to go to homework. And I think Bree has homework that she wants to suggest. Well, I have homework, but before before I have homework, I'm going to give it to Jan. Jan, do you have, we like to give a task for everybody that's watching okay, to just yeah. do one thing from now until next week to make just a small baby step towards progress. So what's one thing you want to challenge everybody watching or listening, um, whether it's now or, or later, what do you want them to do to make progress okay. and well, to learn okay. more? We, we've, we've mentioned a number of different websites uh, and things out there that people can learn information. We've mentioned the Bridge Dance Project. We have mentioned I Adams. Uh, we've mentioned Doctors for Dancers. We've mentioned fordancers.org. Go to one of those or go to all of them and read something, learn something, watch something. There's so much information out there. Uh, just, do, just pick one thing to do between now and next week. Love it. And I am going to challenge you to watch all of our uh, Beyond the Steps episodes from season one and two. There is so much fantastic content. This is a great time to catch up on Beyond the Steps as we're just kicking off season three. So you can see all of those episodes on our YouTube playlist or on our website or on Facebook videos, as Melissa already pointed out. Um, I also want to challenge you to take our Steps initiative course. It is free. 
free. Yes, free. It is a five uh, five part course series that's going to tackle those topics that we talked about earlier from racism, gender and equity, sex abuse and prevention, dance, medicine and science, nutrition, psychology and a little bit more, but it's broken up into five parts. You can take it in your own pace and it is completely free. Look at it as professional development. Looking, Look at it as making your environment a safer, happier, healthier space for dancers because that's what we all deserve at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, we also want to challenge you to check out our friends at YPAD. That's Youth Protection Advocates in Dance, YPAD.org. We are giving you 25% off a certification course for them by using the code APOLLO25. We will plug that in the chat. Um, on each of the platforms so you have that. But our friends at YPAD are always doing great work to keep kids happy, healthy, safe, and dance. They certify educators and studio owners as well. So you can't lose, check them out. Um, Jan, how can people find you, get in touch with you if they have questions for you? Um, w tell them the best way to get a hold of you. Okay, uh, the best way to get a hold of me is probably email. Um, I believe my email, I think, is on the BDP site. If not, I'm going to give it to everybody right here because I'm fine okay. to share it. Uh, it's JD, like my name, Jan Dunn, JD, and then the word Dan Med, D A N M E D, J D D A N M E D at AOL.com, J D Dan Med at AOL.com. And I'm happy to uh, answer questions, connect you with people. I actually, one of my favorite things to do is networking, and I know a lot of people. So. <laughs> She really, you really do. You're like an encyclopedia of people. You know, so many people. Right, exactly. I love, I, Jan, Jan is a wealth of knowledge. So we're just, uh, Jan, I just want to say again, how honored we are to have you. Um, just the work that you've done for our industry. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts for everything you continue to do and for taking time to just share everything in your brain. Cause we appreciate that. Not everything, but a small piece of what's in your brain. Yes. Thank you so I much. And you I am, I am so grateful to you guys for doing this and uh the people that you work with you are you are an inspiration to me believe me oh thank oh, you thank, thank you. you so thank much thank you so much uh thank you everyone for joining us today we are so so very happy um that you have decided to spend your friday afternoon with us listening to this information and please please share um once again like we said we're going to have a podcast we're going to have a blog please stay tuned for all of that stuff then there'll be really no reason that you cannot watch an episode you can listen you can read you can watch it's all there uh, our next yeah. show next friday 2 p.m eastern youtube facebook instagram we're going to be talking about uh, to a licensed uh therapist about how studio owners teachers um, coaches parents can help students deal with grief and loss uh, when there is a loss in their studio community. So that's a very important conversation that we're having, particularly here in October, Breast Cancer Awareness Month, where so many people are being impacted by um, breast cancer and other forms of cancer that may be actually impacting the students and the teachers in their community. So please tune in with us um, next week for that. Um, share this episode. I told you where you can get them all. So please go there, share, share, share. And until next time, Continue your journey beyond the steps. We will see you next Friday. <laughs>